Welcome to the Urban Complex, a system of interrelated, emotion charged ideas, feelings, memories, and impulses. This name takes the definition and lays out what a listener should expect. A podcast where ideas, feelings, and memories collide, leading towards meaningful change. I'm co host Chris Richardson. Please enjoy the journey with the Urban Complex. Smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. All opinions by Chris Richardson, Dominic Papa, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arizona State University, the Arizona Department of Education, or the Arizona Commerce Authority. Any endorsement ever messages from sponsors or slow supporting the production of this podcast. There is no relationship further than podcast purposes with any sponsor unless separately created with another entity. Enjoy the Urban Complex. Smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. Cool, Dom. Hey, here we are again. Uh, what's what's top of mind for you? Uh, another week, busy week. But, you know, I think oh, what's week. really top of mind is, uh, um, you know, with the Delta variant uh, and, and the just uncertainty. I, I know we're still really excited for the Smart City Expo oh, in really? Atlanta. Get down there to see Artie, Joshua, uh, a lot of our other guests, uh, a lot of our upcoming guests that will be there. So, you know, just really, really hoping things can kind of settle down a little bit. But either way, really excited to get to Atlanta, get together with, a, you know, a lot of our people, so to speak, uh, and just see everyone down there. So that's just top of mind right now, thinking about the expo and hoping Artie's doing well uh, as she planned for it. Yeah, Artie, uh, Artie's great. She's been reaching out. Uh, for me, it's definitely there in top of mind, but like, wow, uh, you know, wrapping up the first month at the Arizona Department of Education, education yeah. is kicking off. I mean, my, yeah. my, my, my kids just started school. And, uh, and so all, you know, many schools are starting up this week. Arizona starts early. I was just up in Washington. They don't start for another month. So wow. that's happening. Arizona State University, right around the corner, kids are, you know, students are going to be starting there. So it's just a time of the cycle and it gets you excited, but it's very chaotic and, and there's a lot of focus there. So uh, trying to juggle that with the podcast and all, but it's going well. Um, yeah, so let's, let's talk Boss Borsma. Um, he's our guest today. How do you know Boss? You, 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 you should probably kick that off. You've known him a long time. Yeah, man. Wow. I don't even know where to start. Boss and I go back for quite a number of years now, I believe. I, I'm pretty sure we connected through Lev, uh, you know, the CIO of ASU. But as we were building the smart region out, you know, Boss is such a incredible pedigree of smart cities has done some incredible leadership in roles that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about uh, when we bring them on, but I used him as a mentor and ultimately as a friend, as we were d- developing the smart region vision and how we are constructing it. Uh, he actually led master classes at, for a period of time where we brought the CIOs of all the cities from the region together to go through a three day master class with boss teaching it on what it means to really be a smart city leader. And so uh, not only has he helped us shape the smart region, but he also has helped educate our leaders here in the smart region. So just a tremendous guy with such a wealth of knowledge. His book, The New Digital Deal, is a main stage for smart city leaders. So love the guy. He's going to be a great guest. What what is your background with him? Not nearly as deep as that, but I I remember uh, Lev uh, brought... uh, Duke Ryder, who we've referenced before, I think in social and, and I to an event and not event. We were, we were at this special tour. We had to sign NDAs for the Uber facility here, the, the self the autonomous vehicle Uber oh, facility. Oh, yeah. uh, and we get there and there's this character. It was a boss. So I met him and oh my gosh, what a great experience. Unfortunately, it was like six months before that accident that kind of shut that particular one down. But here we are, we're going, we're, we're getting literally driving in these cars with no driver. I mean, the, the driver was in the seat, but they weren't, the, no hands on the wheel. And I was just blown away um, what we, like how, how it works and, and boss was there. And he was just a character and you knew, he, he, he knew what he's talking about, gave me a copy of his book. And so I've been following him uh, through that and knowing what you've been doing and then what was going on at Thunderbird for That's quite awesome. some time. So excited to get him here. Should we get him on? Awesome. I- I set up the Uber. I set up that trip. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That was you. He should have been there. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. Let's let's get him on. He's going to be awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> Support for this episode of the Urban Complex comes from Worldwide Technology. What if we could connect people to new possibilities, turn thinking into a way forward, solve problems before they become a problem? 
and share the future with everyone. We can. At WWT, we connect businesses to technology to make the impossible possible, to reach better decisions faster, to accelerate progress. Together, let's make a new world happen. All right, boss, please let Dom and I give you a warm welcome to our podcast, The Urban Complex. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dom. Wonderful being here. Yeah, so great to see you, boss. That's me great. Wonderful. Well, you know, we found the best way to get the audience engaged uh, is understanding who our guest is. So why don't you start a little bit about yourself um, and take some time about your background, especially you've been all over the, the map in terms of what you've done. Uh, we'll get to what your current role at City of Rotterdam uh, shortly. So let's just kind of warm, warm folks up with what how you got here. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. So uh, my name is Baz. I'm based out of the Netherlands. I'm a Dutch national. And uh, I was born, as I always like to joke, in the year 29 BG, 29 before <laughs> Google. So you do, you can do the math as to how old I am, right? And uh, but old enough to have uh, grown up in a in a thoroughly analog world, which is a wonderful time to have grown up in. So I saw the entire change happen, and that's always been with me. It's always been part of my journey. I didn't start out in technology, though. I started out with the longest road to unemployment by studying Asian history, believe it or not. <laughs> and I actually uh, ended up working. My first job was at peacekeeping in Cambodia. That was the early 90s. So that's like I started my career 30 years ago. And that was my first job. Never knew that peacekeeping would actually come in handy in a smart city based space. But that, 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 that's a, that's a later, that later tale to tell. Um, I actually started out my smart city career, if that's the right word, 20 years ago. And the term smart city really didn't really exist at that time. It, it was, there were, there were some people talking about smart communities and stuff, but it was really kind of new. And it really came on the back of, of, of you know, the first uh, waves of digitalization, the internet, and the big question, like, what if we get really broadband? What is, going to, what is that going to mean for public services, for healthcare, education? And I ended up building uh, one of the first smart city networks in the world. Uh, that was in the early 2000s. Later on, joined Cisco, uh, which I've been part of, and I've been very proud to be part of for 11 years. Uh, serving as the company's innovation leader for Northern Europe for the final three years of my career. Uh, but most of the time I spent, again, on smart cities uh, at Cisco. I left Cisco about three and a half years ago and been doing several, thi several things first, uh, uh, several things since then. Uh, among them, I joined Thunderbird uh, School of Global Management at Arizona State University as professor of practice at Urban Innovation and Smart City. Uh, several other things, several boards, several advisory uh, organizations, think tanks, act, act tanks. Uh, but as of late, I also joined the fantastic city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands as the chief digital officer. And other than that, uh, Chris and Dom, I'm a father of three boys that all believe that they're very strong with the force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, su such a varied background. Um, you know, you mentioned Google. I don't know if that gets you in trouble with uh, the European Union. I know they're not the, the, the favorite <laughs> friend of uh, the EU. Uh, you, also, you also didn't mention your book, and I see that staring at us right over the shoulder. We'll have to dig into that uh, later in the podcast, too. But uh, the New Deal, I know I've read it. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about your current role. We were really excited to see uh, that you were going to be the chief digital officer at the city of Rotterdam. Why don't you just tell tell our get our audience a little bit of how the role was created, and and don't forget to mention a little bit about the city. I think um, you know many have heard of uh, Amsterdam. Obviously, people have heard of Rotterdam, but maybe they don't know uh, as much. In, in at least our, our audience, I know I've been there, but uh, it's pretty cool. Wonderful. Well, let me start out with the city. Um, very, very, very proud and humbled to join the city as its CDO. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm just getting started on. Just got on board. Uh, but the city of Rotterdam is a large city. It's a uh, very industrial city, one of the larger cities in Europe, and it's also a major port city. The port of Rotterdam is, depending on how you measure uh, the port, it's it's the, 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 first, the first or second largest in size globally. So it's huge. It's also fairly smart as a port. The city itself is very dynamic, extremely entrepreneurial. So whereas Amsterdam is the well-known capital to the Netherlands, strong culture, rich on tourism, 
uh, Rotterdam is the more industrious uh, city, very active, and therefore also a very aspirational city to be working in and to drive the innovation agenda. Uh, so um, um, another thing about Rotterdam, it's got its own fair share of scars. It got bombed by Germany in the Second World War, and it lost so much of its inner city center. It, it got rebuilt, and that spirit of reconstruction, wanting to fight back, wanting to reconstruct itself, that has lasted to date. And you can feel that. It's part of the vibe of the city. And, and all of this has got me excited. Um, um, uh, so, you know, I, I can talk for a very long time about my city, but these are things that are good to know for people less familiar with the city. In terms, Chris, to your question as to how this role got, got created, uh, the city has been going through its own set of motions in terms of smart city experimentation, many, many pilots, uh, lots of sensors going into the ground, you know, lots of things have happened. However, there was a growing sense within the city that it was really important to drive a more social agenda, which would not start out with technology, but which would start out with very clearly articulated social goals, obviously also social economic goals, but actually really starting out with social. Uh, the city's got its own fair share of challenges. And if you don't think of them as part of your innovation agenda, not only will you miss out with your innovation agenda trying to actually solve some of those challenges, but your innovation agenda may end up hurting those divides, which actually is, uh, it can be very damaging. So uh, if mitigation is not part of your agenda, then, then that can be a challenge. So that's been very, part, very much part of the thinking of the city. A second component is that the city realized that the great innovations are unlikely to all be born out of, of City Hall. Don't get me wrong. There are great people at City Hall, and I've got some great colleagues. We've got a great CIO, extremely foresightful. We've got a chief resilience officer who is tremendous. Uh, the people that sit up the CDO team are extremely um, gifted, um, and I'm very grateful for what they've built before getting me on board. Um, and so there's, there's, there's great team. However, there has always been the sense that, you know, in, in building this office, building this team and getting this role created is that some of the best innovations would have to be born out of an outside in type of perspective that you would need people that would really excel by being out there, not at City Hall, but being out there with citizens, with companies, with startups, with academia, with, you know, whoever and build whatever needs to be built and then get those innovations back into City Hall. That would probably be best. And and I, I, I firmly believe in that. I, I, uh, I, um, I've quoted frequently on this topic, uh, Sir Richard Branson, Virgin, we all know him, who always said, you know, also for an incumbent company, if you want to do something radically new, get out of the main building, put up a circus tent. Get out of this atmosphere, go to, go to space. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And get it done there. Get your best people, get them out there, get it done. And I think this would be part of, of the philosophy in creating this role. Awesome. So. I hope this answers your question, but this has definitely been part of, of the city's thinking in creating this role. Yeah, it does. It's, it's a growing trend that uh, the, the innovation spawns outside of the, 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 the concurrent constraints, but you have to know the constraints. That's great. I'm sure we'll dig into it more. Yeah, yeah, I, I just absolutely love that approach. I think it's so unique and so non-traditional local government that it's it's really exciting. So, you know, boss, let's, let's talk. So you're in the role now. Let's talk a little bit about how you prepared for this role, especially because a lot of our, I mean, at least here in Phoenix, there's a lot of change happening, right? A lot of new positions being created, a lot of people on the move. So for our listeners, the city managers, the CIOs, the chief innovation officers that might be changing locations, going into new roles, talk a little bit about how you prepared yourself, especially for this sort of innovation, digitalization out there in the public sort of role. Talk to us about how you prepared yourself. Yeah, it's literally your first week. So this is exciting. Yeah. It's the first time we'll be able to dig into this. <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> there, there, there are many levels of, of preparation. There is uh, emotional and psychological preparation. And there is always a high level of uncertainty. No matter how much you've done in your career, how much you know, how many books you've written, how many years you've spent at a corporate, whatever it is, there is always the question, 
am I going to be able to do this? Am I good enough? Am I, am I, you know, um, do I have the right type of character skill sets to deliver on this? And what if I do face opposition? What if there are people that simply don't like me coming in? I mean, there's these are questions I think are felt by anyone that gets into those role into this role, and anyone that been denying it, I think would not be telling the truth. Really, really <laughs> anyone that changes role anyway, it's amazing that you start with that because people don't share that. That that's that's on people's mind. That's a Brilliant. that's amazing insight. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's very healthy to be in doubt a little bit. And I think, especially when it comes to smart city agendas, uh, uh, I think that there have been too many people over the past 20 years that, that stood on stage with great certainty, you know, delivering their points of view with great certainty as to what the world was going to look like. And I've been part of outfits where we did exactly that. And that was good in some ways. I mean, it helped set the agenda. It woke up the world to the agenda, quite frankly. Good. But as we mature the agenda, it's less about egos. It's less about strong individuals. It's more about team. It's more about you know, listening, understanding where you strike the right balance. And that means you almost have to go in with a certain degree of uncertainty um, and, and, and understanding that you will have to, 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 to learn on the spot and you will have to adapt quickly on the spot. One of the things that's kind of a derivative to what I just said is that more and more and more important in my mind is the aspect of team. I've got a colleague, his name is Arian Merce. Well, don't try to pronounce it after me, please. But uh, Arian, is, he's just one of those heroes. He will rarely be on stage. Uh, he is, um, you know, he's not a keynoter, although he's a great teacher if he, if, he, if, he, if he must be. But I've rarely seen a person who is just such a smooth, intelligent operator, a great listener, who has just prepared his entire agenda, who's been building team. I stand in awe to a person like that who has been able to get through walls, crash silos, get things done and still have people, you know, to like him. That's, that's, that's a skill. That's an art. I feel very privileged that I have a person like that directly as my direct peer in my team working together with him. Uh, another thing about team is that in order to drive not just a smart city agenda, but also if you if, if a person is listening to this podcast and you're sitting in a private sector role and you understand that you need to drive, you know, you need to prepare for a next phase, fourth industrial revolution, you need to rethink how you deliver products, how you sell stuff, how you build partnerships, then you you probably understand that you need to build a team where you find some weird individuals, where you have people that may on their own, you you know, may strike you as odd or 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 even dysfunctional up to a point but you need these gems in your team you need to build team where you get to have the chemistry that leads up to what i call synchronicity a mm. team that just trusts each other completely uh as if you're in the army as if you're out there you know uh you need to have each other's back completely uh a, a team within which politics do not exist and 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 where you're going to be able to rely on very very different types of talent because are, are you are you positioning people that you're the weird one? <laughs> oh, absolutely! No, they, I, had, I, had a funny, yeah, <laughs> I had a funny feeling. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's 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 so important, you know. And 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 the thing is, is that you're you're going to. Here's a favorite quote of mine. I don't know who stated this first. Um, but we're living a paradigm shift. You know, we're, we're, we're living a system shift. And when you're living a system shift, the past stops being a source of guidance for the present and future. Totally. And, and for any leader, you know, that's something, you know, all the education you've had, the MBA you did 30 years ago, you know, you may want to revisit some of that thinking because it's only going to get you this far. You're going to need skill sets which are so different in, in, in part from what you required 20, 30 years ago, especially when dealing with an innovation agenda. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 th th there is this great book out there for those people that are seeing this on video. I don't know if you've seen this mission economy. I hope you were able to get Mariana Masukoto in your in your in your i i i in your in your in your in one of your programs uh, soon. 
uh, mission economy. Mission economy generally uh, refers to uh, or typical example that's being used is the Apollo program, the moonshot, going to the moon, you know, like an entire country coming together in order to deliver on this goal. However, if you do this for a city, it's not just mission economy, it's mission society. And then you deal with citizens and they're unpredictable. You need empathy, you need emotional intelligence, you need, you know, you need to be able to mitigate, you know, mid politics of the most difficult kind. And, and in, all, in, all, in all of that, you just need a very diverse team. So team to me is, is one way of preparing myself and awesome. getting to understand, appreciate all the team members there, expand the team, but also beyond the team itself, make sure that whatever we do is something that's being shared in terms of the agenda, in terms of excitement across the board. Um, I've written about it. I've speeched about it. Uh, but, you know, uh, these type of innovation agendas are a horizontal. They cannot be managed by one, one vertical alone, by one department alone. But even if that's decided, even if a formal mandate is there, that does not equal success. You just need to go out there, reach out, talk to the other department leaders, make sure that they're on board together with you in what you do, that they share the excitement, that you can support them, but they also see what is in it for them by supporting you. And I think, I think this is part of, of, of preparation and you can start out early with that. Um, 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 another thing, and, and then, then we can hopefully go to the next question. I, I think what's very important is to really ensure that you understand the problems that you're dealing with. You know, for any uh, smart city leader, and I actually took this from an interview with the uh, CIO of the city of Sacramento in California, uh, uh, Maria Miguelos, she's she's great, she's wonderful, she's an excellent leader, and, and she said, you know, in, in in getting this agenda right, what you need to do is go to where people are. Don't just have your quintessential workshop, you know, with one or two or three citizens claiming that you understand what their problems are about, but you need to go into the city, talk to people, understand the problems. And this is homework, which never stops. You actually need to do this. And also that is part of preparation. Hey, Dom, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> No, I think that's um, great pieces of advice, boss, you know, especially because there's so much changeover. I'm just thinking, you know, we, we our city manager of the city of Phoenix, fifth largest city in the country, just announced that he's retiring. So big position to be filled um, and just, you know, leaders stepping into a role like that. Uh, this would be great advice for them to listen to. So thanks for that. So, um you know, I'm a little bit of a governance nerd. I love to harp on the structure of the local government. How are these leaders establishing these positions, these teams, as you mentioned? So talk to us about the role in the structure of the city of Rotterdam. How, where does it sit? Who do you report to? Um, how does it function within the team, uh, you know, the smart city, quote unquote, team there? So the entire idea of this team was that it was always going to be a very fluid team, which would not be like a traditional department anyway. And to the point I already mentioned, what is a very bad idea is for digital digitalization and the city's innovation agenda to be seen as something that's owned by, let's say, the IT department or any one department uh, in, that, in that sense. What is very important is to ensure that this is something that's taken horizontal with a mandate that's horizontal. However, there needs to be political leadership that says, you know, we're the prime owner to this, uh, first yeah. of all. And, and uh, so we have a elderman who is responsible for economic affairs, digitalization, and neighborhoods, a very interesting combination. And <laughs> she is above all, first of all, in charge. She's, she, she, has, she carries political ownership for all of this, but she doesn't do it alone. So, but politically, she would be my most direct boss. And then there is, again, to, as I mentioned, there is a clear sense of mandate across the board within the municipality. But then again, uh, the CDO role is, first of all, so a very an external role. So the idea is, yes, there needs to be some type of internal way of ensuring that ownership and mandate has been organized and they have been. However, then please go and play outside, you know, uh, get your job done, um, uh, build hubs, build networks, build public private collaboration and come and tell us about it. And, 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 and so this is how it's been organized. 
uh, you know, um, from my own experience, looking at some other cities, uh, in, if, I, if I take the European scope, there are cities like Almira, Rome, but also a city like Reykjavik in, in, in Iceland, which have done a tremendous job in creating this kind of semi-fluid organizations that sit in, you know, in the middle of the spider web. They do report, like they have direct lines, but also like plenty of dotted lines to multiple departments, which allows them to be very influential, to expand their circle of influence within the organization. Uh, but sometimes also being given additional mandate to stop particular things from happening. And I, I'm always inspired in that sense by Singapore and their smart nation program, uh, which because it's national government in an island state in a city, it's it's on a national government level. But that uh, smart nation program reports directly into the prime minister's department. Now it doesn't outrank ministers or individual departments. However, it does have a mandate to actually um, say no to what they call stupid procurements that run counter <laughs> to Singapore's innovation agenda. And I think that's very foresightful. You know, can we get that in Arizona? Awesome. <laughs> 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 no, but you know, and, and so, so the, the, the fair balance of saying, look, you do not outrank those department heads. They have their mandate. They have their annual budgets. You know, you're not going to yeah. touch them. However, you are going to be in a position of power to call it out when stupid things are happening and to actually make your case when something does need to happen. And I, I think Singapore has struck a, a very good balance there. I can only dream of achieving that balance. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, this has been great to understand kind of a little bit about the city, a little bit about the role. So let's let's really tie it to the theme of smart cities now. You know, the, me and Chris have kind of have a running joke now. We're asking every guest on the podcast, what's what's their ideal definition of smart cities? Because, boss, we go back forever. As you know, there's no one true definition. But talk to us a little bit about how what, what's your vision for smart city? What's your quote unquote definition for smart cities what's working, what's not working, and then how are you applying that kind of vision into this new role uh, for the city? Well, it's a great question, uh, Dom. It's a great question. And I think it's a multi-million dollar question and it's come to the whole thing, the whole smart city uh, concept has come to mean so many different things over the many years, in part because technology has changed. And 20 years ago, it was all about broadband, it was all about connectivity. And then the academic question, was that going to mean for, you know, for, for the various spheres of society, healthcare, you know, education? Uh, and that's how it got started. And then we got into this hype around the Internet of Things. And then it was more an issue of data. We're already starting to talk about artificial intelligence today. So that certainly influenced the agenda. I think one of the things that has really become a major game changer is that people have moved away from putting the central focus on technology to uh, smart cities really being about very specific perspectives on what we want to achieve for our cities and our communities. Now, it's very easy to call that out on a very abstract high level and to say, Obviously, we want smart cities to contribute to the well-being, prosperity, and resilience of our communities. So whatever policy, whatever technology, whatever innovation agenda will help us get to the next level of prosperity, well-being, and resilience, that, that, that is great, and that could be your definition of a smart city. I would like to add something to that, Dom. It's, it's, while that is probably a fair, fair definition, I think what is important is that smart city um, has come to mean, to many people, it has come to mean like a, it, it, evokes, it evokes these pictures of many sensors, technology experimentation. And the other side of the coin is that a lot of people have come to distrust it. Like, oh, this yeah. big brother society, we're being watched, government yep. stepping in, watching every step of where we go. And I, and I think, and quite rightfully so, there have been lots of people being very critical of that chapter of smart cities and saying, look, not only did those people get it wrong, but there are so many imaginaries, smart city imaginaries, as it came to be called, where there is the kind of all too, uh, too, all too easy assumption that smart cities will contribute to green agendas, that they help green cities, that they will help you know, create a better mobility environment. And these are imaginaries. The challenge with that is that 
those people that have been very critical have assumed their own set of imaginaries. Um, um, for instance, the assumption that it's all about privacy. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of people say, yeah, I care about privacy, but I care about my security also. There diff there's a different balance to that. So, you know, yes. there's all these people that have been debating smart city and we need to arrive at a new consensus as to how to drive this forward. There is no point in sitting in your own silo, in your own, in your own bubble in terms of whether you're pro or against that particular old perspective of what a smart city is supposed to be. We need to move forward also because, and this is an important call out for me, that the time for you know, playful experimentation is over. I think it's pretty much in our face we're, we're not living the most joyful of times. We're going through a pandemic. And while most of us have been vaccinated in our part of the world, this continues to be a tremendous plague. And we're not out of the barn yet. This is, this is just continuing to hurt the world in the worst way possible. The implications for healthcare, for public health are going to be there. Uh, and it's going to be with us for, for, for years, if not decades. You know, uh, if 9-11 changed our entire perspective on physical security, you know, COVID-19 is going to change our perspective of public health for totally. decades to come. And this is going well, to... And, and not just health, but the way we live, the way we work, how we get educated. Like, the whole thing is being thrown, in, thrown in upside down. <laughs> Ab absolutely. You couldn't be more right. I mean, I totally agree with you. Education and all of these fears. So this is such a dominant component. But then if, if, if we think that COVID-19 is pretty bad and pretty big, then this is like your general... Uh, you know, rehearsal for climate change. Um, uh, uh, climate yeah. change is big. I, 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 luckily, we're getting to a point where we, we hopefully end this chapter where there's people that no, do not believe in climate change. I think that it's pretty much in our faces in terms of, you know, what's happening around the world with, with fires, with, you know, with, 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 with floods, with extreme weather locations. And much of that is going to, you know, we're going to pay a price for that in our cities. There is no, 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 no yeah. doubt about that. And, and this too, I mean, this is where smart cities is, it, this is not just like some peripheral, peripheral some experimental yeah. sideshow. This should be core up front and center to what we do. Because if we fail, uh, if we fail to science class out of these challenges in our cities, then we're done for. We are in a very yeah. serious situation. This is now. We need to cut, we need to understand this now. And this is smart cities to me is about also is about creating prosperity, creating new opportunities. But on the dark side, it is about overcoming some of the gravest challenges that humanity has ever, ever faced. And the time is now. We can't just say, well, this is up to a next generation. You know, where, whatever you're doing, we must tackle this now. Smart yeah. city is a huge mission. And, and this is, and for anyone involved in it, and that goes for you, Chris, it goes for you, Dom, it goes for me. This is not about having a job. This is about a mission. And I feel yeah. about it this way. And this is how we should think of smart city. So we're, we're not going to, before we switch gears and kind of talk about some, some other things you're doing, we, we, I don't, I don't want to let you off the hook. Uh, let's say AG 25. So that'd be kind of after Google, maybe five years from now. Uh, what, what do you think Rotterdam looks like because of your efforts? And I mean, you know, I love the quote that uh, the past stops being a source for the present. A lot of the things you've done in the past weren't in the past. They were forward looking. I mean, with Cisco, you were pretty modest with your background, like the internet of everything you helped create. That was kind of the catalyst force. Like you've been on, the uh, Cities Today Institute. Um, you've been part of the Smart City Association of Italy. So you've been thinking about this for a long time. Like, help our audience know where you're going to take Rotterdam. I know there's a lot to figure out, but maybe two, three specific predictions of where you're focused. Okay. So I, I used to have a business partner a long time ago who used to say, in five years from now, we're going to have the same as we have today, except for that it will be working. And, and I, I really, I really love that particular perspective. It's a very pessimistic perspective, but I, I, I love it. So there is a lot of things that, are, that is being, there is a degree of truth in that. I mean, there is, there is, there is, um, there is a lot of things that are getting, that is being experimented with and that we, that will be working in five years from now, which is, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, but then there's also a lot of other things. Um, I, I, I think, um, 
Over the past 10 years, there has been a lot of discussion. I did my own fair share of, of, of thinking and I wrote my book about it. You know, what are the ingredients that you need to have in place in order to you know, prepare for success in the smart city space? And in my own writing, I, I carved out a model with 20 building blocks and you may be familiar with it or you may not be. Uh, but, but there is many things which were then understood as like uh, a, 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 um, a, um, let's say a, a part or it, a, an ingredient indeed, a stepping stone towards something larger, which is true. However, there are components which are now somewhat maturing. Some of these ingredients are maturing and they are, they are a, they have become a deliverable in their own right. And a great example to that is uh, modern governance. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, in order to drive an innovation strategy for your city and, you know, arrive at a, you know, technology implementation as we would have it five years ago, people agreed that you needed to have a new type of governance where there would be horizontal collaboration across departments in the city, but also where you would move beyond city, uh, uh, city hall walls and reach out into the ecosystem and get the types of collaboration going. Dom, you've been steering this, you know, yourself uh, in, in Arizona. You've been that star. You've been the spider in the web in, you know, building that type of collaboration, getting that type of governance going. Now, I'm going to quote another writer, and I know he's been guest on your show, uh, Jonathan Reichenthal in his book, uh, you know, uh, uh, Smart Cities for Dummies. He said, you know, in fact, in some ways you could state that my book is not just about, uh, you know, great technologies and smart cities, but it actually lays out what 21st century local government is supposed to look like. And, and I love that. I love oh, that cool. perspective. I think it's very powerful because what he said with that particular point of view is that, you know, through the motions of getting smart cities, right, we accidentally have produced <laughs> governance models, which are actually producing the type of governance that we need. Totally. A government that we need. And, and, I, and I, I, so my hope to your question, and actually my expectation is that in five years from now, we see more and more of that type of governance mature. You yeah. will see traditional government leaders either stepping into that zone or at least getting ready to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and standing in embrace of some of those new governance structures that have yeah. to operate outside their silos and in fact, outside city hall to yeah. actually create a culture of collaboration where you're going to have to understand how to work together with private sector, where are you going to prepare for new types of public private collaboration, where you're not just going to have the traditional public private collaboration. Look, I'm government and I set the terms and then we have a public private collaboration and we're going to agree on, you know, you know, preset investments, but rather holding each other accountable to what each side does best. And that takes everyone outside their comfort zone. And you see people going through those motions. You see yeah. people learning right now as we speak. And that's a formidable thing. So as part of what I think is going to be an outcome, what we're going to see mature in a period of five years is exactly this. You, I could say, well, you know, the city of Rotterdam will have great smart parking solutions. Actually, I'm not that interested in smart parking. Uh, I'm interested in these type of new types of governance, these new models of governance, because if we get them right, then we'll everything get follows. Right. <laughs> yep. Yes, the whole thing will come together. Exactly. See, see, Chris, can you tell why Boss and I are, we're such good friends? Are such yeah. good friends. <laughs> we. I remember me and Boss would say to have coffee for hours and just talk about how we could create new governance models to drive smart cities. And Boss, that was a fantastic answer. Loved it. It is funny, though. I'm, I'm glad you got the plug of the new digital deal because I, I, I love the book. Um, but be careful when you talk about your intro and, your, and how you're processing. And you said, you know, people, even if they, you know, given the books they've written, not a lot of people starting C CDO, CIO roles at cities have written books, just FYI. Um, <laughs> Hey, Love it. One thing, I, I will have to talk Arizona State University and Thunderbird in a minute, or I might get in trouble back home. But tell, tell us, like, Chief Digital Officer implies the digitization side. Like, what is what is what? What do you believe is at the core of that? Uh, from your mm -hmm. mindset, um, so I think it's I think it's important. Uh, CDOs have been used pretty loosely in industry. So, just curious your perspective there and how it applies to a city and where, how how you're going to use that role. 
So I, I thank you for asking me that question, Chris, because it's a very, very good question. I, a lot of people think that the, the role of CDO is kind of the same as CIO. Like, you know, yeah, but you're all dealing with technology and data, right? You're, you're both in charge of automation and bringing, making digital a reality. Uh, apart from one job being, being, that might be more on the internal side than the other, apart from that distinction, to me, uh, uh, actually not just to me, digitalization, there's a definition to it, which is not the same as digitization. Right. So we've been digitizing ever since the 1950s, essentially, you know, taking some things from the analog to the, to, to the digital. Let's yeah. say a library archive, you know, going from the old analog format to doing it digital. We've been doing that for many, many, many decades, ever since, well, what is it, 1970s, in a case like a library. Um, but digitalization is about an entirely new culture where you're, you're going to find things are networked and not just technologies or sensors are being networked, but people, organizational structures, um, um, an entire culture. Look at the way we befriend each other. Look at the way we learn. Take a 12-year-old and how the 12-year-old is learning. They, they, their process does not look like when I was in school. You know, the, the teacher used to have the monopoly on learning, the teacher would, you know, determine would be the boss, would, you know, central, have called the, 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 the whole, he would be, or she would be the, the central holding power in terms of what you would learn and what you would not learn. Learning has now become a massively distributed affair, totally networked. That change, that shift in culture, that's what digitalization is all about. So to me, the chief digitalization officer um, or chief digital officer, but it refers to digitalization um, in, in the way we framed it, in the way I would frame it, is about taking that shift, that paradigm shift into the city and make sure that everyone is on board. Love it. So, so many people are conflating that term in different ways. And it really goes back to the last question, what you hope to see in five years. I, I, I'm glad we asked. Thank you. Um, so yeah, before we ask our final question, which is uh, standard, you know, tell us tell us about your role as professor of practice at Thunderbird. That's Arizona State University's uh, School of Global Management. Like, what have you been building there? Um, what's it look like? What's the promise? How 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 uh, who attends? Like, what's the audience? So I look. I, this, I'm just such an incredibly proud member to this larger Arizona State family and the Thunderbird School of Global uh, Management family. It's an incredible family to be part of. And it's a little bit odd. I'm, very, I'm this Dutch guy from the Netherlands. It's an incredibly gray, wet country, you know, and then you've got Arizona. It's hot. <laughs> Desert, you know, it's, 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 it's almost opposites, which is why I love going over to Arizona. Um, but apart from that, I mean, Arizona State University, for starters, uh, from my perspective, looking at NUS and European universities, I've rarely seen a university which which is so inclusive and at the same time so working so in such a cross-disciplinary way, which has been one of the challenges for universities like cities, you know, operating very siloed. Uh, but then, you know, you can get stuff done at ASU uh, that you wouldn't be able to get done at other universities. And that's mm -hmm. amazing. And that's very important for the smart city space. Now, if I think of Thunderbird School of Global Management, uh, that is such an aspirational business school. It's, it's like, it's been like the other business school. It doesn't think MBAs. It thinks global management. How do you prepare for global leadership? Now, with the type of challenges that humanity is facing, the shifts that we're going through, the fourth industrial revolution that we're all going through, which allows for tremendous opportunities, huge new business opportunities. But, you know, you need to step up as a leader, as an entrepreneur, you need to educate yourself. And I could not think of a better business school around the world than Thunderbird School of Global Management. It's just hugely aspirational. It recently uh, got their space program started, leadership in space. People, who, who, who does that? Who actually launches a space leadership program? That's just totally awesome. I mean, yeah. I, it just it just gives me the chills, you know. Like so, to be part of a school like that is just so incredibly inspirational and aspirational. And I think if you look at the colleagues, the people that are part of that, you know, you you find that a lot of people they bring that to the table. They bring that sense of aspiration. As insofar my own role is concerned, I'm I'm professor of practice on on urban innovation and smart cities. 
And, and, and we've said, look, this is important. If you think of the fourth industrial revolution, which is one of the main, main uh, topics, one of the main angles for, for, for Thunderbird School of Global Management, then cities is like one of the, you know, one of the main canvases. This is where it's happening. And if you don't get that right, then, you know, then, then you're not complete. So uh, the leadership has decided that this is really, really going to become part of the core. This is, this is, and we're, act we're stepping up efforts. So what we've done over the past year or so, we've been building our online executive education course on smart and resilient communities, which is um, uh, phenomenal. Uh, it's, um, when I got started in building this, I got a team around me and I did not know what they would be able to do. I was just <laughs> totally flabbergasted and awe at the interactive nature and the beauty of the materials that they make. And when I saw the first module come online based on the content that I had written and that I built together with others, I was like, wow, did we make that? It's just the best material. And I know what's out there. I've seen the stuff that I'm not going to give you names, but some you know, <laughs> pretty big names, some competing universities out there. And let me tell you, they don't get to the level of what we've done. What we've built is just the best. So great, that's a great response is. from people that have attended too. I mean, I, I know I've talked to a few. I'll, I'll tell you though, I think Boss is making a play for AG25 to become the dean of Thunderbird. I mean, boy, you're out there selling this thing, you know. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe the next iteration of Boss 10.0 uh, is going to be the dean of Thunderbird. So we'll see. I, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very scared. <laughs> I'm very scared you saying that because, you know, I, I'm beyond the, beyond the pump. I, the current leadership, the dean, uh, dean, dean, dean Sanjeev Kagram, he is just amazing. Oh, amazing. <laughs> visionary leader and very proud to be part of, of his team, his school, uh, what I call his movement, because that's close to what it's becoming. It's becoming a movement. Uh, but beyond the executive education, uh, uh, online executive education course and cert, and cert that we have built, uh, we also got uh, great, great programs in place around smart cities uh, for graduates, masters, and PhD students. Uh, the National Science Foundation of the United States uh, has sponsored Arizona State University in terms of their smart city program, and Thunderbird and ASU are actually delivering on the curriculum together, together with other schools at ASU, which is phenomenal. So this is such an interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary uh, 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 course um, uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, probably one of the best places. And we see some of the very, very, very best PhD students coming in into the program. So uh, if you needed any further evidence that is used the place to be at the, on, you know, on this topic, you know, I couldn't point out a better example. Cool. Well, you've, 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 uh, you've mentioned one already with the mission economy, but is there anything to help um, us kind of choose other leaders like you um, that you want to recognize along your journey that you think might be a great uh, future guest on the Urban Complex? Oh, yeah. But it, 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 I, 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 you, you wrote me that question. And then there is the agony of choice. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> I, oh, boy, I've got this long list of people that I would love to bring in. There is one person uh, that I would love to propose, though. Uh, he used to be my boss at Cisco, and his name is Anil Manon. Uh, he's uh, based out of and Bangalore, India, and out of uh, Florida. Um, he used to be vice president at IBM. He served as senior vice president at Cisco. Uh, he is the uh, advisor to Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum, and he is a trusted advisor to the uh, Prince of Wales, the Crown uh, Prince of, uh, of, of, of the United Kingdom. And he's been working on smart cities forever. And I, I mean, this person is just one of the most philosophical, articulate, fun people to talk to. I, oh. Just make sure that you've got two hours rather than one. In <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have, to, we'll have to steer it right. I, no, it's not sure if the audience can handle it. That'd be, that'd be great. We'd love the introduction. So either to Anil or to the author of the, um, the, the, the book you mentioned, Mission Economy, it'd be great. Um, well, yeah, it's been been like we thought, Boss. Thanks for joining. Uh, the Urban Context gives a note, big note uh, of today's guest, Boss Bursma, Chief Digital Officer of the City of Rotterdam and Professor of Practice at Thunderbird School of Global Management. Thanks for joining us, Boss. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so a great to see you, Boss. Pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Awesome. Bye. 
Support for this episode of The Urban Complex comes from MST. MST is a Salesforce certified integrator. We work on building customer experience solutions and deploy them for our customers. As we started evolving, our why also continue to evolve as a company. Over the last three years, uh, the whole approach was really revolving around what we call three C's, which is customers, colleagues, and community. Wow, Don, that was great. Before we get to boss, it's been driving <laughs> me nuts since uh, we, we, we kicked things off. I can't believe that Uber trip is where you and I met first too. And I, 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 I'm embarrassed <laughs> that I didn't even think of that until after. It feels like that was 10 years ago, but wow. it, you know, it's funny. Small world, right? <laughs> yeah, sure is. And, and it's funny how that little thing brings people together. It's kind of the spirit of this podcast and kind of oh. what, and the spirit of just what Boss said as well, kind of a, this connected world and the new way things happen and how things interact. But why don't we jump in? Like, what'd you think? Uh, what, what stuck out from the, from the Boss episode? Oh, uh, gosh, so much great stuff there. I always learn new things when I speak with Boss and I, and I absolutely love it. I, a couple of things that I, I think I, just want to touch on um, one. It's this. It, it's this um, actual realization that smart cities needs to live outside of city hall, um, and the kind of direct focus. And I'm, I'm escaping. The words are escaping me right now. But understanding that, hey, we're going to hire this person, and he, they're going to just work outside. Go build partnerships. Go build. Very similar to Joshua and, last week, right? right? It's like it's like get out of the paradigm and, Building, yeah. and, and create, you know, create and help us move. Yeah. Yeah. It's a proactive like approach, right? They, it's not, Oh, it just happens to be that they work out there. No, we're going to hire you to do that, to go out there, to expand city hall boundaries and where the people are, where the partners oh. are, where, where the change needs to happen. And, and I think cool. too, <laughs> it, it's just a new mindset because the, the old mindset of, well, you better be in your seat in city hall. People need to see you. Or they're thinking we're wasting taxpayer money, right? It's, there's a new paradigm. But his his quote that. was so critical, right? We're living in a paradigm system shift. The past stops being a source for the present and future. Like, and it, it's not just the tech. It's not just totally. the, the way it's worked. It's the structure. It's everything. Like, totally. you just have to yep. look at it fresh. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that maybe that's a great transition to the second point that I want to talk about. And he hit, and you knew I was probably going to bring it to the governance piece of it. Yeah. Um, but the the theory of new governance models emerge as a result of innovation in smart cities because we're out there trying new things, testing new things. The, the processes, the systems, the structures of government itself has to adopt or adapt, has to change, has to emerge as innovation proceeds, right? We should not, we should not have a focus on innovation yet, yet not try to enable government culture or processes or structures to shift with innovation, right? It's, it's embrace the structural changes as innovation pushes it to change. I just, I love that idea of, you know, new governance models emerging as a result of innovation in smart cities, because that's, the, that's the thing that always kills me. It's, you know, technology is changing at an incredible pace, right? It's obliterating municipal boundaries. It's obliterating, obliterating processes, yeah, and yet we, we try to solve these challenges with ordinances. The same construct we've always had, that, right? It's, that were established in our yeah. charters from 1912, right? It's, <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't, it's impossible. There's going to be friction. You've got to be willing to embrace the change. And I think that was a theme throughout Boss's entire uh, podcast was embrace the change, right? Yeah, and I, th I think his perspective of what a chief digital officer and how it's not about data. It's not even about digitization, which some people, yeah. it's truly digitalization, which is cultural. It's, it's a networked world. It's, um, it's people. It's, it's, it's those, obviously, the org structures you just mentioned. It's how we interoperate. It's how we learn. Um, and he's looking at it holistically. Uh, I've, I felt that, he, that also the way he highlighted um, I'm pulling this up right here. The, it, it's kind of tied back to the where people are, right? Like if your leader is operating behind the barrier of the city hall and behind the law and not out in front and not embracing the change, 
you're not going to get a new outcome. And so yeah. like, and if your IT is just focused on the tech, you know, we've talked about that before, you're not going to get the new outcome. And so it's pretty cool. The boss has been um, kind of all over uh, so many different parts in his background. You, you know, it's a high likelihood that he's going to do some great things for Rotterdam and he's going to help make this vision come through. So it's yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah, we'll have to have him back on and yeah, see what for he's sure. <laughs> It's great. Not definitely not waiting five years either. Yeah. I was joking around on that. But try, trying to get him like I, he's always got ideas. Of trying to get him to like bring forward specifics, but still, I think where directionally where he's aiming is such, so great. Well, let's talk cracks in the pavement. I know that um, you probably have a good idea. It's usually me grabbing something off yeah. of a smart city dive. But what, what are you thinking? Yeah, actually, I, I found one on uh, Forbes this week. It, it's an article that they interviewed sixteen tech leaders. And they share big potential benefits of next generation smart cities. Uh, so, yeah, so it's 16 members of their Forbes Technology Council, and they, they're, they're sharing the potential upgrades they most look forward to. So these leaders picking one thing that they most look forward to, and they highlight a series of, you know, of different areas of smart cities that hold kind of the most potential. I thought it was just fascinating to see what some of these, you know, national global leaders are excited for the future of smart cities, right? And they, they talk about unprecedented efficiency, optimizations for sustainability, rapid integrations of new technologies. And they, they talk about one, one leader talks about one that I thought you would be very interested in, especially what you mentioned in the intro here is connected classrooms. Um, yeah, the smartest yeah. cities of the near future will foster smarter education. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, the superintendent of Arizona Department of Education recently released um, a tech task force induced uh, study that they're calling digital teaching and learning. It's got me super excited. Uh, from what I've gathered, it'll be the first ADE uh, IT led program and significant. We can, in, we can, we can help uh, advance the connectivity in the classroom, or excuse me, the connectivity in the classrooms, which just, you know, through our E-rate programs, had decent success and just elevate that, but help build the gap for our rural communities getting connectivity at home. I know you've been involved in that. We heard a lot from Joshua last week, but then also the tech that's in the classroom and preparing the teachers for how to use it at scale and how to get the students to use it at scale, how the parents can help support it from home. And I think has a major economic development piece if we can really make this happen. Um, And so, yeah, what's in here is just consistently tech enabled schools could close the digital literacy and education gap for underprivileged students and help create better outcomes for students of all learning styles. It is hundred percent sure Arizona hopefully will get behind this thing we're putting forward. I can't see why not. Like if yeah. you raise the bar for everyone, like everyone wins. And uh, we've talked that many times. It's a part of the smart city themes, you know, boss uh, talked about the three areas of uh, well-being resiliency and prosperity i mean this is what it's about so i think it's a great article nice find yeah 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 we'll definitely have to we'll share it through our social media because i mean if you're if you're looking just to get into smart cities it, it does a great job at highlighting so many yeah it's a nice things. broad canvas yeah yeah definitely awesome cool well that's a wrap thanks all yeah see, you, see you next week bye thanks for listening to the urban complex smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow please find us on where you listen Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. We do love your feedback. Let us know if you have ideas for guests or questions to air on Cracks in the Pavement via social media. The Urban Complex is found on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Or just shoot me an email, chris at theurbancomplex.com. Until next time.